money's a way of keeping score. You know, it's and in my mind, it's not a way of being happy. You know, if you're you know, it's still your innate state is you're either happy or you're not. And you know, if you've got more money, you can just be miserable in comfort. So. The insanity of starting up your own business. Yep. <laughs> Every founder has a whole set of resources at their hand, but if you had a founder's toolkit, what would be the tools that you'd have in there? The first one is a bullshit detector. The fact that you're doing things that haven't been done before. People are everything. If you were to write a book, what would be its title? To paraphrase Bill Clinton, uh, it would be, it's the people stupid. The time that you want to give up is the time when it's most important not to give up. Welcome back. My name is Ross Tuffy and this is Founder.Scott, a series of conversations where I invite founders to share their insights, learnings and experiences of founding a business with me and of course with you. So if you're a founder yourself or thinking about founding a product or a company or simply want to understand more about the roller coaster that you might ride when you start your business, stay tuned. Hopefully over the next few minutes, there will be something that will help you on your journey. In this episode, we cover the second part of the conversation that I had uh, a short while ago with Alan Nelson, the founder of Foresight. In our first episode, we discussed Alan's journey and also discovered a lot about the challenges of building a senior team uh, to lead the business, as well as the importance of focusing on what the customer really wants. In this episode, we ask Alan what advice he would give his younger self now that he is further along the founding journey and we investigate what are the most useful tools that Alan has in his founder's toolkit. We discover what it's like to exit a business and ask Alan, if he were to write a book about his journey, what would be its title? So without further delay, let's get back to the conversation. I founded my company, uh, Dogfish, in 2009, which is about a year or so after the iPhone was, uh, was, was founded. And we spent the first two years talking to large corporates and saying, why mobile? Why they needed to be bothered about mobile right now? It sounds ridiculous now. You know, we're now 14, 14 years, 15 years further on from the founding of the iPhone. And people would go, well, of course, mobile. But actually, the first two years, we were literally saying, you need to be bothered about mobile because. And then suddenly it flipped into how mobile. So effectively, we were making a market or the market wasn't quite well the market was was ready <clears throat> but it wasn't quite ready if you know what i mean so i mean maybe that's in the hotel sector you you've discovered you found that as well i don't know i i think for the first the period from 2000 and 2008 say through 2013 14 it was a conceptual sale interesting it was either somebody who who got it yep or just wanted it or it was an educational piece Around about that time when we built V2 in the middle of the decade, the, the American competition started to appear on our shores. And um, then it became more competitive. Yes. But we were still in a good position because it was still, it was still being sold to early adopters. And a lot of them, if, they're, and if they were focused on the core data itself and then doing what they wanted with us, we were the ideal solution. If they wanted a fairly basic feed from a property management system to, to a really simple email tool, it was one of the Americans. Yeah, okay. You know, you know, the market has evolved more towards us because, um, you know, it, it's it's the that whole data piece is becoming okay. If we get our data sorted legally, securely, everything else, that's where the money is. Yeah, you've had GDPR come in and all the rest of it during yeah. that time. So, so yeah, there exactly. there is a, an argument that you know playing the long game was the is the right way to go about yeah. it. You know, that, that's interesting. Let's go back. Let's go back to the founding journey. Your founding journey. Yeah. So. What, what is it, let's talk about being a co-founder or founder, what is it that you really enjoy about that role? Um, it, it, uh, what, what sort of kind of gets you up in the morning going, yep, yeah, I'm off again, here we go, sort of thing. It's the people. I, I, I love building the team. I love finding the like-minded people or, or, or the different type of people who fit in with what we're doing, what we're trying, what we're trying to get to. Our, our, our job, and both Richard and I feel this way, is, is very much, you know, the, the, there's a provider element to it. We're, we're, we're creating jobs yeah. we're we're creating good jobs we're, we're doing that in, in scotland obviously um we're also we also did that 
for a number of years, obviously, but we still do that in Northern Ireland. So both Richard and I are from there, so I was very, very proud to invest back in the province where there was a great, you know, skill set of people and just great people generally. Uh, gave us the excuse to go home all the time as well. And see That's always good. <laughs> yeah. um, so, it, but it's, it, it's, it's building that it's, and it's learning about people. It's seeing what additional people can bring to the business. It's, it's seeing people grow and evolve. We have a number of junior people who have come through the business who are accelerating really quickly through it. Um, and technical roles and, and customer success roles, and we're, we're so happy about that. Um, but for me as well, it, it's going out. It's, it's building something new. It's it's building the product. It's making technology do what it's not done before, which is really exciting. Um, and, and it's also building a business model, and it's building, you know, and, and, and it's building a revenue stream. Which you know, money obviously is a motivator for anybody who gets into this. But you know, money's a way of keeping score. Yeah, true. You know? Yeah. It's and in my mind, it's not a way of being happy. You know, if you're, you know, it's still your innate state as you're either happy or you're not. And you know, if you've got more money, you can just be miserable in comfort. <laughs> so, Good, yes. So it's uh, so you need to work. So so it's whatever makes you happy. And I think, but also for me as well, and you know, going out into the market, and um, which is why the last two years has you know been a bit of a struggle. Um, you know, working on our strategy and you know, seeing the excitement of what's coming next learning about what's going on, learning about how to do it. For me, it's all of that stuff for me is just great. That, that, that's, I, mean, I, I think that's interesting because that, that phrase that I, I come across in my head, which is, I wonder if we could, I wonder if, you know, that kind of, that excitement, that kind of curiosity back to, you know, stay curious. Yeah. And various mechanisms have been put in place by my team to make sure that I'm not going straight in going, forgetting about last week's new shiny and, and this week's new shiny. So they, and they, they keep you in tow. They keep you in, in yeah, they keep me, they, yeah, they keep me in tow, particularly the head of products as much as anything. Um, she, she's always making sure that I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm not getting in the way of the process. I'm, 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 I'm feeding in all the time, but, but I, I kind of realized as well. And I think it's one of those founder things is you need to learn when to let go. You need to learn when to step back. Um, I've also done that with our commercial team, because I think as a founder, you, you're, you, you can be guilty of selling at any price because you just desperately want the business. And, and therefore, over the years, I've learned to step back from that. And it's what I would call the founder's fear, the fear that if you don't get the product, you know, if you don't go in really low, you won't get the business and your business, your company will never move forward. So my commercial team know there's a real barrier there that it's up to them. They have the freedom to go out. They know what it costs for this to do. They know what we're trying to aim for, and they have. A, I give them a lot of flexibility in terms of their pricing, which ultimately they are accountable for. And that again, that's that's that empowering people to do what they yes. are good at doing as well, and realizing our own limitations as a founder. I mean, I think yeah. that that leadership, that passion, that drive, that vision, these things always sit within the founder's role. Um, having said that, I know founders who have been technical technically brilliant and have moved into you know the sort of technical leadership role so if, if you like rather than necessarily the overall ceo role because you know just be, you are the ceo and founder co-founder but yes. you can be the founder i remember reading um bill campbell's book a book about yeah bill campbell's book about um coaching etc and 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 that difference between a ceo and a founder you know you'll always be the founder but you might not always be the ceo because you might not necessarily i'm not saying in your situation that's the case but you might not be the right person to be ceo and that's quite difficult for a founder sometimes to think about it, it, it was difficult when i was younger yeah and more, more egotistical and uh, and everything else and i hadn't learned a lot of what i learn now i, I think if I want to do this job, I have to learn how to do it, and I have to learn how to do it in twelve months' time. I have to learn. I have to learn how to do it in eighteen months' time. So I'm always thinking, what, where will I need to be myself in eighteen years' time? And as time's gone on, it's become more hands off. It's become more about communication, and the rhythm of that communication is a big thing for me as well. Is making sure there's continual, constant dialogue. Issues are getting raised. We deal with them on a on a regular basis. Very influenced by. There's a book I'm reading at the moment called uh, we we have which is called Traction by Gina Wickman which is which is excellent, and um, Traction very very good and also the, if if you read um, uh, I think maybe we discussed this previously Ross actually the the Netflix um, yes the, the, the Reed Hastings book as well talking about that and he spends huge amounts of his year just going around talking to senior people in his business which is takes up massive amounts of his time but but he that's where he gathers the information it's something I need to get better at. 
yeah. keep saying to my team, right, I'll, I'll get, because we're obviously not in an office at the moment, I'll get around you all, I'll have a chat, and I've probably got around about half of them since the new year. The intent is there, but the but the but there's a yeah, you get distracted. It will put the links, we'll we'll grab those links and put them in the in the in the chat below because I think that there's some great books out there that that have really made you think differently. But that whole communication thing, in fact, the 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 podcast we did last week of, of with Willow, he, they talked about um, starting in a, in a, in a sort of a, a, a VW Beetle and you, you're sitting next to your co-founders, you can just chat across and then you move into a bigger car and you've got to talk to the people in the back and, and then you're in a taxi and you've got to communicate with the taxi driver as well who's third party and then and then you move into a minibus and you've got to shout back and then eventually you're in a double-decker bus and you've got to keep running up and down the stairs to tell people. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. And it gets more complicated. Because you, but yeah. you have to keep doing it. You absolutely have to keep doing it. So The balance between between burning cash and retaining it, for, for our type of business, for the way that we've done the business, you know, it's it, because it's ours, it's no other investors in there. It's like, okay, well, obviously, we need to invest money at points to make money, but there, there's a... You're always sitting there looking at looking at a bit of money in your bank account, and, and there's times it goes down and there's times it goes up. Yeah. You know, when do you invest? When do you consolidate? Um. Yep. So, so it's all balancing that. It's and that's more difficult for the likes of us to do compared to somebody who is who raises a million pounds or two million quid in a Series A, and therefore they are expected to burn it. Um, in our case, it's like okay, well, you know, do we? Do, do, yeah, do there's, there's more choices in there. Yes. But is that a good or a bad thing sometimes? That's a difficult question to answer. I mean, in, in a sense, it's like potential energy, isn't it? You've got this big, um, if you raise money up here, you've got this big water tank that you just turn the tap on and it rushes out and you've just got to get, you know, burn through that, that, that flow. However, you don't have quite the same um, pressure or, or, yeah, that's interesting. You, 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 we're in an interesting position at the moment because we... After 20 years, uh, on the 19th of August 2021, the day before our 20th anniversary of the yeah. Opry in Northern Irish, <clears throat> excuse me, business, um, we sold it to um, a, we sold the mailing business, the original business, to a, a company in, in, in Dublin that um, I will give a shout out to. It's a company called Mailmetrics, uh, based in Dublin, uh, run by um, CEO's guy called Nick Keegan. And they are doing some brilliant stuff um, in the in the kind of financial services, utilities, mailing. Uh, industry um a, a really interesting business to watch the guys are um have got a great model to to scale into the uk and it was the right time for us to 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 exit that side of the business but also uh, i thought i think what they're doing is really really cool and we're, we're really happy that that acquisitions has gone to a very good home and a lot of our our, our former team there are now rising stars in that business which is fantastic great. that's great so, and they're a really interesting story if anybody ever comes across it. But and they're, sorry, they're called what was their name again? Mail Metrics. Mail Metrics. Mail okay. Metrics. And um, so, but the, the interesting thing for us then is that what happened is because as a result of that, we raised some money yeah. because we sold the business. So therefore, um, and, and the way that we legally structured it actually worked for us. We just loaded all the mailing stuff into the Northern Irish subsidiary, and off it went. So yeah. that so you know the consideration came through for that. It's you know sitting in our bank account and. Um, slowly burning at the moment and that's the that's the, the quandary for us i think as, as as founders and shareholders we've had this experience of going through an exit yes lots of money in and it's like it's not like raising you know a series a round uh, normally because we would expect it to invest that heavily as quickly as possible we're yeah. still looking at it going that's 20 years worth of that's in richard's case it's 30 years worth of work yeah absolutely it's not as you, you you've got to think carefully about how you invest that and what you invest it in so exiting a business as an experience how was that for you how did you feel about that and how, how did it go what were the what were the kind of nuggets in there that you go whatever you do <laughs> make sure you do this you know it, it was it was fascinating process um we didn't solicit it they approached us um we didn't speak to anybody else in the market we probably should have but and it, it felt like a good fit at the yep. time. Um, we spent, it was about an eight month process from December uh, December 2020 to August 21. Um, I was involved, myself and Richard, obviously we did the whole negotiation piece at the start. There was heads of terms there. Once the heads of terms were agreed on, on, a, on a price um, after about two months, I was able to step back out of it. Richard was the one who took the brunt of, he had to, the two legal businesses that we had were structured well for the exit, except the trade went through both. Okay. So we had to do a carve out. 
So that that complicated the the financial due diligence. It complicated the legal due diligence yep. up to a point, and then so I was kind of hovering in the background. Probably, to be honest, probably being distracted by it because this thing is going on, and obviously it's a very big thing. Um, but in the meantime, running the foresight business, I had to go. We had big plans at the start of twenty twenty one for the foresight business. Yep. I had to go very cold on. The, I had to go very quiet on those. Right. And we just had to. We just had to kind of kick a few cans down the road. Um, but then in, in, in the July, um, the, we got to the stage of the last four or five weeks of, of the, the shareholder agreement and, and all of that negotiation around it, um, which for me was a really, really interesting process. It, it, a lot of it, it all culminated in a series of, well, there was daily calls going on with lawyers and accountants and everything else, but it actually culminated on a Friday afternoon in this very room on the laptop with the two guys on their side, the two of us. And yeah. the several points that we just came to an agreement yeah. on, you know, it's just, just like that, just done. And it was just, you know, all this complexity and what ifs in behind it. Suddenly, suddenly we sorted it out. We got to the Monday, we signed the deal on the, on, on the Wednesday. And then we, they flew over on the Thursday and they, they met the team here. That was actually the 20 year anniversary. And then we went out in the evening, we had a great night yeah. out and they were going to meet our Northern Irish team on the, on, the, on the Friday and my job was to make sure they were absolutely hanging out and they were, so that was Excellent. great. It's all lovely. And, um, you know, my, my learnings from the whole thing was it, it's, a very, it's a very human process. It, it should come down to the, to the founders, to the key decision makers to actually strike a deal. And then in, in behind it comes the lawyers and the, and the accountants. We had excellent advisors in Northern Ireland, uh, everybody, Northern Irish founders. I um, strongly recommend the guys at ASM and Davidson McConnell. Yeah. They were brilliant. Um, and what that said to me was, make sure you match the size of the advisors to the size of the deal. Interesting. Yeah. You're, doing a, you're doing a small deal and you're using one of the big four accountancy firms. You're probably going to end up with a, with a junior member of staff working on your account. If you use a smaller firm, you end up with either a partner working on it or a partner very close to it. And I think that, I think that really helped. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I found when I sold uh, Dogfish, we sold to Insights and Dundee, and yeah. uh, we used we actually used Thorntons, who are a big, you know, big organisation. But they were they were very good. You know, they were very um, yeah. focused, and uh, and and we'd never been through this before. Like you'd never sold. I don't think you'd sold a business before. Had you, had you sold a business? No. So it's a completely new thing, and um, and and the amount of. Um, administration behind it is huge it's huge i mean i i put my ops i said to my ops director for the next four months this is this is top of your list basically to and that then took me out took him out of the business which was obviously a challenge on the business as well so you, you've got to continuously run the business as you say you know with, with foresight so there is you know that you've got to keep you, you got, it's more work you can't you can't not run your business you've got to run the business as well at the same time you know so yeah, it, it probably helped with, with, with Richard being yeah. the CA. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. Yeah. we also had accession in place in, in, in our director in Northern Ireland at the time who was already running that side of the business. So that there was things that had happened. But in terms of having the accounts ready, having the legals ready, there was a lot of work that had to happen almost reactively. And that would be my advice is, is get, if you can get your house in order and also get your, your own shareholding structure, your tax structure correct, because all, it takes time for that to work through the HMRC a couple of years, to be honest. So therefore, get all that sorted uh, uh, up front and, and be very clear you have all your contracts in place and everything else. It becomes easier when a suitor arrives. Somebody once told me, um, your company, if you, have, if you have the intention of exiting, then effectively your company is for sale the day you start it. So actually, all of those things, you know, you're managing um, all the, the administration and keeping every, you know, all the employee contracts and all the, 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 the shareholder agreements, et cetera, et cetera, making sure they're all in place saves a lot of heartache at the end there. So, but anyway, that was, that was their view. So I've, yeah. we've got just a short time left on this. Um, just thinking about if you were to look back on your, your younger self um, and you were to say, what might I do differently? And what advice, what advice would you give the younger Alan as, as, as he, comes through that start of, of his career and particularly the founder journey. Um, it'll take longer than you think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a lot longer than you think. I think, you know, you, you hear about overnight successes, you know, someone wins a gold medal at the Olympics, never heard of them before. Wow, isn't that brilliant where they come from? 
yeah. we're 10, 10, 12 years getting towards this. Um, I think celebrating the wins and reflecting is, is very important because um, it, it takes time to build up a business, take time, takes time to build up a revenue stream. I mean, you know, we've now got a very solid seven figure revenue stream, you know, and that's, that's great. It's, it's a lot of money, um, but it's a lot of cost as well. But it, that takes time to build up and they sometimes sit back and go, you know, actually we are, we are achieving, you know, that, that's fantastic. But how do we get to the next stage? Um, uh, I would say surround myself with the right people. I yeah. think over the years in our business, not that I was in control of a lot of it, that there was maybe some people we had in the business that actually just weren't the right fit for the business at the time or, or ended up in positions in the business where they were operationally exceptional at what they did. But strategically, they probably shouldn't have been in a leadership or strategic role. It just muddied the whole water. So that's something I've learned. Um, you know, get personal recommendations of who to work with. Find the, find the experts. Use your network. Build your network. Use your network. Find the experts. That's a really powerful thing, that whole network, that peer-to-peer -peer thing. And, and, and ask, ask. Don't be afraid to ask the question, you know. So. I mean, and, and from our own perspective, we probably should have split the business operationally a lot a lot longer and split the, you know, we should, because I probably needed the focus as much as anything else. There was always this other thing that I was looking at over the years and, and involved with. And I, you know, in, in hindsight, I'd probably rather I'd have split the business, left that with Richard and I would have just focused on the, on the mainly on the foresight product, which is what I'm, I'm able to do now. And it's been a revelation. You found that position, that, 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 that state that it really meets what you need and your skills and your your passions as well, which is which is phenomenal. So just just thinking through, um, you know, every founder has a whole set of resources at their hand. But if you had a founder's toolkit, um, what would be what would be the tools that you'd have in there? Have you got any 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 sort of nuggets for that? Um, uh, it's just not so much tools, more advice. I think a stable personal life really helps. So you know, uh, family and friends. I mean, I mean, my my wife particularly over the years has just been a fantastic foil and a fantastic source of advice i mean she, she's a she's a she's a you know a, a teacher you know 20 odd years experience so therefore you get you know from that um vocation you get a lot of appreciation of people's psychology and that yes, helps yeah. dealing with people you know you, you could some class reflect but also her support and, and the wider family support you know my working with my you know my father for a number of years was, was an interesting experience and, and she probably changed our relationship in a lot of ways you know but also Respecting, you know, and the support from my mother as well, who was just just a you know, ferocious individual when it came to, in, in a good way, but when it came to, considering she's she was she was an ex polio, um, you know, um, patient or whatever, um, yeah, yeah, um, from the fifties in Brighton, she she just created this persona and this drive that she had, which is just amazing, um, and to do that as a woman in Northern Ireland in nineteen eighty in the nineteen eighties was not necessarily very easy. And to be taken seriously, um, but also for me, it's a library of the right reading material. It's you know, but stuff I've already mentioned. There's all there's, this laptop is currently got several of those books under it. Uh, at the cool. There's a new, there's a new use for the books. There's a new use for the books. Uh, there's loads of stuff. Yeah. Um, a black book or knowing people with the black book. Yes. You know, yeah. Get out there and have those conversations. There's been years I've identified certain people in the space and gone, I think I need to talk to them. Yeah, and I find my way to get to them. So you are very good at reaching out um, to networks. I mean, I've, my experience of, of working and, and, and speaking with you, you, you are you are always asking the question. Do you know what about? Do you, can you help me with you know that sort of thing? And that's a really powerful capability to do that. So. I go back to a brilliant quote I heard from Gregor Lawson, who's one of the guys who founded Morph Suits. Okay. Back in the day, and grandson of Bill McLaren. For anybody who's interested in the rugby. Oh yeah. And he, um, he, he was speaking at one of the Startup Grind events, which again is another type of thing people should go to. And he said, look, his job, his job as the founder was the sales and marketing commercial end. And he said, look, you go out there and you have conversations and you have thousands of conversations and you look for the conversation that takes you on two years. Yeah. And yeah. quite simply, that's, for me, that's, that's what you need to be able to do. For some people, it's dead easy. For other people, it's not so easy. And there's been times over the years for me, it's getting the confidence up to actually go out there and you know uh, and richard and i both over the years it, sometimes it's easier to sit in the office and just do stuff whereas actually you need to, uh, some one of the founders needs to get out there and that needed to be. think about it think about the conversations you've had in business that, that led to a, a large contract that led to a, 
a pe- you deploying a piece of functionality or a strategic opportunity or indeed maybe even your exit. So, Alan, if you were to write a book, what would be its title? Uh, to, par- to paraphrase Bill Clinton, uh, it would be It's the People, Stupid. <laughs> and you can't, you can't do anything without the people, whether that's, whether that's clients, suppliers, vendors, obviously your team, obviously your founders, um, and people who will help you get to where you are. I, I saw a, a brilliant um, thing, uh, thing at the Turing Fest a few years ago. And, and to, you know, to mention the Turing Fest, I think it's a fantastic initiative in, in terms of what happens in Scotland. So yeah. Brian and the team doing a great job there. Um, I think it was the, the lady was the head of people at Nucleus Financial, who are an interesting business in themselves. Yeah. She was very straightforward and simple about it. She said, look, it ha- there's three things you need, um, three Ps, people, process, profit. And in that order, if you don't get the people right, you won't get the process right, you won't make profit. And I think that's, so pe- people is it, people are everything. The three Ps, yeah, people are everything. I think that's, that's it. And, and and the culture you set around those people as, as a founder and things like that. Yeah, no, but it, people, absolutely, yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much um, for being our, our guest and being here today, Alan, and, and for handing over so many nuggets and so much interesting stuff and useful stuff so really really appreciate your thoughts thanks so much that's great well, it's no problem, Tom. great stuff brilliant thanks so and if you guys out there if you want to um, chat more about the subjects raised in this podcast or hear about future episodes and the guests that we'll be speaking to uh, then please join the discussion at www.founder.scot you can also follow us on twitter at founder dot scott so founder dot scott but founder dot scott on linkedin at founder dot scott uh instagram the same and then on youtube at founder dot scott those links will be posted below and thank you all very much and goodbye <laughs>